So we've looked at the general properties of a matching function. Now what I want to do is cover a few well-known popular matching functions and study them uh, quickly. So just look at what their properties are and what are the trading probabilities that they imply. Um, so the first one that I want to uh, cover is the earn ball matching function. So uh, what's nice about this matching function is that it admits a very simple micro foundation. So if you want to build a model with a matching market and a matching function that can have a very simple micro foundation, a very simple uh, you know, micro basis, then uh, you know, using an earn ball market and obtaining the earn ball matching function is the best way to go. So what's the foundation for the earn ball matching function? What is the setup? So we have a market and um, we'll assume that we assume that we'll have uh, B buyers and uh, S sellers. And so just to make it uh, more concrete, um, when we make the derivation, let's think about uh, the restaurant market. Restaurants and uh, lunch uh, customer. So here's the idea is that you have a bunch of restaurants um, and so the restaurants are of course a seller. And we assume that each restaurant has just one table and they can serve uh, one meal for lunch. So they can only accommodate uh, one uh, buyer. So we have B lunch customers and what they want is to get one meal at lunch. Okay, uh, so you have this S restaurant, they have one table, they can serve one meal and you have this uh, B lunch customer and they, you know, they're at work, they have time to walk to one restaurant and, uh, and, and that's all. And they hope to get, uh, they hope to get a meal. And here, what happens, the reason why we we'll have some, uh, not all restaurants uh, are going to be filled and not all lunch customers are going to get a meal is that each lunch customer is going to decide to go to one restaurant are going to work there, uh, but the lunch customers, they don't know each other and they don't coordinate with each other. So it's possible that um, several lunch customers head for the same restaurant. And in that case, you know, because the restaurant has only one table, they can take the first customer that comes in, but then all the other customers are going to be turned away and they won't be able uh, to get their lunch. Okay. Um, so that's the setup. And of course, it's also possible that none of the customers go to one specific restaurant and then that restaurant has just an empty table and is not able to sell, uh, to sell their meal. And you can see here the issue, the matching uh, problem is that the customers don't know where the other customers go and they don't know which restaurants already have a customer and which restaurants uh, are uh, empty. And so because you know, of this lack of knowledge, you may have some customers that go hungry and you may have some restaurants that are empty and are not able uh, to sell their meal. So in a setup like this, how many uh, trades are going to happen? How many matches are going to happen? How many basically meals are going to be, uh, are going to be sold? Well, to figure it out, and so we're going to derive the number of matches here, which is going to give us our earn ball matching function. So, Let's put ourselves in the fit of uh, one restaurant.
So if you're one restaurant, what is the probability that you get a visit from one specific uh, customer? So you know that the customer is just going to pick, he has a choice between S restaurant is just going to pick one at random. So the probability that one specific customer comes to your restaurant is one over S. So that's the probability to get a one specific customer. That's because the customer is going to, you know, pick one of the rest, one of the S restaurants at random. So now the probability to not get that specific customer, well, is just one minus one over S. Okay, so for one specific customer, you have a probability one over S of getting that customer and one minus one over S of not getting that customer. Okay, so now what's the probability of getting none of the customers? Well, for each customer, you have a probability one minus one over S of not getting them. Of course, the choice of all the customers, are, are, as we discussed, are independent. Um, so the probability of getting none of the customers is just going to be one minus one over S, which is the probability of not getting one of the customers to the power of the number of customers, which is just a B. So from the perspective of a restaurant, it's a probability to get uh, no customer. So this is a probability to get no customer uh, for one specific uh, restaurant. So here we have the probability to get no customer at all. And now what is the probability to get at least one customer, which uh, is then going to be the probability to sell a meal. Um, well, the probability to get at least one customer, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, what's complementary to the probability that we computed. So the probability to get at least one customer is just one minus one minus one over S to the power of B. At least one um, customer. And this probability to get at least one customer, that's the probability to sell a meal, because as long as one customer comes, you'll be able to sell your meal as a restaurant. Okay, and then, so this is the probability to sell a meal. Or if you want, um, it's the um, expected number of meals that is going to be sold by one restaurant. Because with that probability, you sell one, and then with the probability one minus one minus S over B, you sell zero. So this is just the expected number of meals sold by one restaurant. Okay, uh, and of course it's less than one. And now what is the expected number of meals sold by all restaurants? Well, it's just, you know, since the situation of all the restaurants is independent and we have S restaurants, well, if one restaurant expect, expects to sell one minus one minus one minus one minus one over S times at the power of B, the expected number of meals sold by the S restaurant is just going to be S times that. The expected number of meals sold by all restaurants is going to be S S times uh, the expected number of meals sold by one restaurant, which is one minus one minus one over S to the power of B. 
Okay, uh, so this is the expected number of meals sold by all restaurants. And if you want, this is the expected, uh, this is the number uh, of uh, trades that are going to occur on this restaurant market. Okay, uh, so here this is good. Um, however, this can be greatly simplified and then a lot of the properties are going to pop up with just one simple approximation, uh, simplification. Because you know, otherwise, just by looking at that, for instance, it's not clear actually that the matching function has constant returns to scale. Um, but there's a simple simplification, an approximation that will then show that the constant return to scale comes up uh, easily. So how do we simplify that? Well, uh, we can rewrite 1 minus 1 over s to the power of b. This is just the same as exponential of b times log of 1 minus 1 over s. This is just by definition of uh, power. But then we know that log of 1 uh, minus x is just the same. Uh, you know, when x is small, it's just approximately uh, the same as uh, minus x when x is close to 0. And that's just by linearizing the log function. So we know that a good approximation of log of 1 minus x is minus x. Um, so now if we plug this approximation over there, what we get is that 1 minus 1 minus s b, it's well uh, approximated by x, the exponent of b times, and I'm going to replace log of 1 minus 1 over s by minus 1 over s. Okay? And so it's well approximated by the exponent of minus b over s. Okay. And uh, once we plug in this approximation in our matching functions that we had above, we get that the number of meals is going to be, uh, so if we go up, it's s times 1 minus x of minus b over s. Um, and that is uh, the expression for the matching function. So this is um, the earned ball matching function, which gives the number of trades, the number of matches for a given number of seller S, number of se and number of buyer B. So what are the properties of our matching function, of this earned ball matching function? Do they, you know, are they in line with uh, what we assume for the general matching function? So, well, we can, you know, we can verify a few of these properties uh, just by looking at the uh, looking at the matching function. So, first of all, uh, we can check that, of course, if the number of sellers is zero, uh, indeed, our matching function is going to be equal to zero. And you know that makes sense. If there are no uh, restaurants here, you won't have any meals that are served. So, that's checked. Now, what happens if you have some sellers, but you have zero buyers? Well, we can see that if the number of buyers B is zero, the exponential of zero is going to be one. You have one minus one, and the matching function is zero as well. So mathematically, we see the matching function is zero with no buyers, and that makes sense if there are no buyers. In our little story, there will be no uh, matches uh, that are realized. Then we can look at uh, whether the function is uh, increasing or decreasing its argument. So the easiest one is to look at the derivative of the matching function with respect to the number of buyers. So you can see that if the number of buyers goes up, minus b over s is going to go down. x of minus b over s is going to go down. But minus x of minus b over s, that's going to go up. And as a result, the matching function is going to go up. So here we can see that uh, the matching function is increasing in the number of buyers. 
so that's just by look, you know uh, using the result that we know from compound uh, function. Now, what happens when the number of um, sellers go up? Well, this is a bit uh, trickier because, of course, when S go, goes up, um, the matching function tends to go up because S is in front of everything. But you have two forces that are uh, opposed here. The first S goes up. Um, but at the same time, you have an S in the denominator there in the exponent. And so when that S goes up, B over S goes down, minus B over S goes up, X of minus B over S goes up, but then minus X of minus B over S goes down. So that's tend to pull the matching function down. So we have two, you know, the first term goes up, second term goes down. This is a little bit tricky. So we need to take the derivative to check that indeed the matching function is increasing in the number of sellers. So we need to check the partial derivative of M with respect to S. So here we have, um, a product, so first we take the derivative with respect to the first s, so we just we are left with one minus x of minus b over s. Um, then we need to take the derivative with respect to the second term, one minus x of minus b over s. So the one disappears, you have a minus that's uh, left. Then you need to take the derivative of x of minus b over s. So first we need to take the derivative of minus b over s, that's plus b over s squared. And then of course uh, the derivative of x of x is just x x of s. So here we get exponent of minus b over s that's going to stay here. Uh, so now we can simplify things a little bit. So we get one minus e minus b over s, and here we get a minus, oh, something that was uh, left over here is that, of course, the terms that we have here above, this is, of course, all multiplied by the s um, that's in front of uh, the matching function here. Uh, so it's s times the derivative of the second term, which appears here. And so here we can simplify the two S's. So we have a minus, we have B, we have an S in the denominator. And then we have, uh, and we have E of minus B over S. Right, then we can put everything together. So we get one minus one plus B over S times exponent of minus b over s. And this we can rewrite it as 1 minus 1 plus b over s divided by the exponent of b over s. All right. And so that's our um, partial derivative of dmds. And the question, of course, is what is the sign of this derivative? But a result that we know is that, of course, uh, e of x is always greater than 1 plus x. That's a simple but, uh, of course, super important result and that we use often. Uh, so that's key. And so because for any x, uh, e of x is greater than 1 plus x, any real, uh, it's true that uh, the exponent of b over s is greater than one plus b over s. And as a result, these fractions that we have here, this is always going to be less than one. And just because x of b over s is less than one plus b over s. Uh, and because that's less than one, one minus this fraction is going to be positive. So what we learn from that is that dm ds is strictly positive. Okay, and so we confirm that the matching function is indeed increasing in its two arguments here. Uh, although this was a little bit um, tricky because um, you had to take the derivative. And one thing I want to say, of course, is if you want to, if you're wondering about why E of X is greater than one plus X, you can just remember, uh, you know, if you just plot you know that E of X is a convex function 
and that goes through one at zero. And you know that the derivative of E of x is E of x. At zero, that's just one. So you know that the tangent to E of x uh, at uh, zero is just uh, one plus x. That's the tangent to E of x uh, at zero. And of course, because E of x is convex, it's always above its tangent. And so E of x is always greater than one plus x. I mean, there are many ways to prove that, but you can see it graphically very easily. Um, and so that allows us to uh, get the properties of the earned ball matching function, which is a very useful uh, function to use when you want a simple uh, micro foundation for your matching process. Now, one thing that you can see from the mat matching function here is that we have the earned ball matching function, that there are no ways to parameterize it. Uh, it's just s times 1 minus a x of minus b over s. Okay? There are no parameters here. And so, of course, it makes it a bit hard to use it if you want to calibrate the matching function to match things that you see in the real world, because here there are no parameters to calibrate. So it's a bit of a rigid matching function. And so in practice, um, we use matching functions that have um, one or two parameters um, that can be calibrated 